welcome um, heartily to what I think is going to be a very special evening here at the Unheard Club. Uh, to the small number of you, no doubt, who are not sure what the contours of Ayan Hirsi Ali's life look like, um, let me just sketch them out. She was born in Somalia, lived in Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia before settling in Kenya as a teenager, was a member of the Islamist Muslim Brotherhood, uh, a devout Muslim at that time. She escaped an arranged marriage and she moved to the Netherlands as a refugee, went to university, became an MP, and after 9-11, she renounced that faith and eventually wrote the global bestseller, Infidel. She was prominent in the new atheism movement, so much that her friend and admirer, Christopher Hitchens, described her the most important public intellectual probably ever to come out of Africa. She moved to America. She has written many best-selling books um, and been a powerful advocate on feminism, freedom of speech, enlightenment values, immigration culture, and much else. And most recently, she stunned the intellectual world by announcing that she now considers herself a Christian that she did in the pages of Unheard three days ago. So perhaps we'll come to that eventually. Ayan Hirsi Ali, welcome to the Unheard Club. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I want to start by just reflecting on the last few days and few weeks, because it feels like the themes that you have been talking about for decades are once again absolutely at the center of our conversation here in the UK. Uh, I mean, I was present at these enormous protests that took place in London over the weekend with a overwhelmingly Muslim crowd um, chanting all sorts of slogans in support of Palestine and full of rage at what they perceive to be the UK government's attitude. What reflections and thoughts have you had watching this story play out in the last few weeks? I thought of 9-11-2001, and I think that what we saw in the last few weekends, these protests, these demonstrations, all relate to the 7th of October, um, 2023. After 9-11-2001 happened, the reaction was, we are all Americans and we are horrified. And we woke up the next morning and I think we realized that we had a global problem. I think there was a great deal of denial back then that uh, what we were at war with was a particular religion and that it may be a civilizational confrontation. I think first they're addressing us uh, and they're making us privy into what they think. And when I use the word way, they, let me be very clear that I don't mean all Muslims, certainly not. And I don't even think all of the people who are out there protesting actually know um, uh, or have a very well thought through idea of what they're protesting for, what they're protesting against. Sometimes these protests come across as recreational activities. Um, but what should we be asking of um, these individuals? Um, it is to engage with them, I think, in the most meaningful way that the, the, um, the values, the religious values and the norms that um, they defend and that they're willing to die for um, are not of here, and that we are just as determined to stand for what we believe in. And there, there has to be a moment where we, we make choices, we all make choices, um, but part of that choice, and I remember in the 1990s, 2000s, it used to be, if you don't like it here, go back home. It's not as simple as that anymore. A lot of people who believe in this, who actually believe that Hamas is completely justified in doing what Hamas did, are born and raised here and have been to school here and have their businesses here and are raising their children here. So it's not as simple as just saying, send these people back home. Mm. But I think that there is going to be sooner or later a confrontation about what it means to morally integrate into a society. The conversation on the political right in recent weeks has been quite interesting that it seems like some people have given up on the idea of integrating that community and there's much more direct talk about 
yeah, if you don't like it here, go home, or if you have dual citizenship, your citizenship should be rescinded, etc. Do you have hope that in Western countries like this, um, that large Muslim community and the, the, the more devout members of it can be integrated? I mean, do you have hope of that? I have hope. I think my story is a story of um, hope. I was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. I believed in some of these things that the people out there are saying. Um, I think when I was 16 or so, if this event had happened, I probably be, would be one of those people who celebrated it. I took part in the book burning of um, Salman Rushdie's book. Um, but I evolved, I changed, I grew. And I actually did that under very, very difficult circumstances. Um, whereas I think living in Britain or in America or in any part of the West, instead of being bombarded with all the activism that comes from these brotherhood types where they've established schools, they've established uh, online platforms, they've established charities, they've made, basically taken control of the educational, meaning-making, uh, spiritual um, institutions, I think we can offer something else in return, but we do have to work for it and we have to agree uh, on the basis of what it is that we want to transmit. One of the questions that uh, I have asked myself is, what is it that immigrants have in common with Gen Z? And that is that both groups um, have been failed by us because we're failing to transmit to Gen Z, and we're failing to transmit to immigrants who come here what it is that they are going to inherit, what this society is all about, the most basic fundamental principles of this society. Mm. You rejected the faith that you were brought up with. Yes. And what's, it seems like you fell in love with a new creed, which was Western liberalism basically. You know, you, you write here that I left the world of faith, of genital cutting and forced marriage to the world of reason and sexual emancipation. After making this voyage, I know that one of these two worlds is simply better than the other. Do you still believe that's true? Uh, yes, of course I do. <laughs> yeah, I live <laughs> I live it every day. Um, um, I thought it was, uh, um, when I came to the Netherlands um, and discovered that it was actually possible, for instance, for men and women to interact uh, peacefully. Well, until quite recently. Um, mm. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, the woke people have, have created all these uh, problems. But uh, I, I just thought that, you know, we had man-made governments in Europe and the rest of the West, and that was secular, that established rights and protected those rights with institutions. Um, that there were universities where you could pursue any line of inquiry without any kind of condemnation. These countries were wealthy, there was a great deal of tolerance, and I fell in love with all of that. At that point, I was contrasting it with where I had come from. And my rejection, reading Bertrand Russell, and uh, you know, in Holland, I made some atheist friends who said, this, is, this has nothing to do with religion. We've also struggled with our own religious darkness and intolerance. And so Christianity, they said, was exactly the same as Islam. And later on, when I met Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens and so on, I think I jumped probably too soon on that atheist bandwagon and accepted the proposition that all religions are the same and are equally bad and equally dark too quickly. Mm. And I've now, uh, I, I just think it would be intellectually dishonest of me, number one, if I say, I'm still radically atheist, I'm not. Mm. Um, but also, more importantly, if I uh, don't take responsibility for my part in advancing um, the, um, the erosion of the building blocks of, of 
this Western civilization that I say I love so much. Mm. So that secular liberalism that you fell in love with, um, part of what you've been writing, not just in the most recent essay, but generally is that you're worried that it's not enough at a cultural level to compete with things like Islam or, or, or other cultures that still have very strong kind of calls to our soul. Is it that, that we should no longer believe in Western liberalism or is it, is it an and and question rather than either or? It's very much and and. I think it's very much an acceptance of classical liberalism, but equally socialism, by the way. Um, these are products of this Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, there have been all of these debates within Christianity about tolerance and how much um, scientific inquiry and how far do we go that, the human rights and where does that stop. These are all children. The enlightenment is a child of these Judeo-Christian traditions. And I think you have to recognize that because otherwise you're literally cutting off the roots. Um, there was when I was at the uh, at ARC, uh, the Alliance for Responsible um, Citizenship, one of the participants um, said that Western civilization risks becoming a cut flower. Um, and, it, and, and I think that's what we don't want. We don't want to pretend, I don't want to pretend that all of these great things, the nation states, the universities, all of these economic advances, military advances, that somehow they just came floating along with the Enlightenment. I think the Enlightenment is a product of that. And Tom Holland, who also writes for Unhad, in his book Dominion, I think has done a very detailed historical background uh, without hiding the negative stuff, without hiding the bad stuff. Mm. Um, where, uh, you know, uh, how these things are linked. Uh, and I think we've been asking the wrong question. Um, you know, can you prove that uh, there is a God? And I'm not sure that that's the right question. If the question was asked, it was answered uh, to the degree that you have people who uh, ended it, that debate with let's agree to disagree even that stance in itself is very Christian and very Western. You, that's not how it ends in Islam. Let's agree to disagree. You don't believe in, <laughs> you don't believe in God, give me your head. Um, mm. um, and so, so that's, I think, where, and I think we sort of achieved that. And I think it's a pinnacle. And the next stage now is to preserve it for the next generation, to transmit it to the immigrants who have chosen with their feet to come here. Hmm. So what does that mean? I'm just thinking practically. I mean, you've campaigned almost over the years for secular schools for, to, yeah. keep the, to keep faith and, and schooling separate. Does this mean that in the schooling system, in our education system, there should be a reintroduction of these kind of Judeo-Christian ideas? Or how do you think it applies practically? Yeah, so I do apologize for, I, I said when I was a member of parliament in the Netherlands, I said, I think that Muslim schools should be abolished. I was put in charge of the integration, the assimilation portfolio. And I thought, well, if they're going to Muslim schools and they're, going, they're being Hamasified, they're not going to integrate into Dutch society. And not only that, but they're also going to be left behind. So you're giving them arguments to be deprived and to be excluded. So I wanted Muslim schools to be uh, closed. I still want Muslim schools to be closed, but I was very much mistaken about Christian schools. And Christian schools here and in the Netherlands and everywhere, these are the schools that are churning out kids who are balanced and happy and well-established and responsible citizens. So I don't think Christian schools should be shut. I think Islamic schools should be shut. So if there's someone watching this who then writes on the comments that it's a double standard, yes. how, how can she say we should close Islamic schools but not Christian schools? What, what, would you, what should we write back underneath for you? <laughs> um, it is um, more than, a, it's a double standard, but it's more than a double standard. There is a higher standard. 
And it's that higher standard that has brought all of those Muslims to come here and establish themselves here. And because that standard is higher, that's the standard we would like to maintain and upkeep. And I think we should stop being um, shy and inhibited and very coy about uh, who we are and who we have to thank for all of these successes. So then the, the message, I suppose, is that you are still a liberal as well as a Christian. Is, yes, is that fair? that's very much fair. And say so that, that liberalism is rooted in Christianity. Um, a lot of people were also questioning what appeared to be a more of a sort of practical way of making your faith decisions. And that was very discussed. I mean, the article has been read many hundreds of thousands of times already since Friday and no, no doubt will continue to be. But I did notice that as a common response, which is, it felt like a, a justification or, or a discussion of Christianity as a mechanism to resist cultural collapse, almost. Mm -hmm. um, and there was not so much of a personal journey, not so much about your own faith. Um, is there anything that you would expand on that? Um, it's, so the reason why I care, first of all, you have you know, a limit on the number of words that you want to publish yeah. on her. <laughs> um, and, and I'm expanding this into a book, but yes, there's a very personal story. I don't know to what extent um, it's useful, but on a, on a very personal level, I went through a period of crisis, um, very personal crisis of fear, anxiety, depression, I went to the best therapists money can pay. I think they gave me an explanation of some of the things that I was struggling with, but I continued to have this um, big spiritual hall or need, as you call it. Um, I tried to self-medicate. I tried to sedate myself. Um, I drank enough alcohol you could use to sterilize a hospital. <laughs> <laughs> It would not, uh, nothing helped. Um, I continued to read, you know, books on psychiatry and the brain, and none of that helped. All of that explained a small piece of the puzzle, but there was still something that I was missing. Um, and then I think it was one um, therapist who said to me early this year, I think, Ayan, you're spiritually bankrupt. And at that point, I was in a place um, where I had sort of given up hope. I was in this place of darkness, and I thought, well, what the hell? Uh, I'm going to open myself to that and see, see, you know, ask her, what are you talking about? Mm. And we started talking about faith and a belief in God. And I explained to her that the God I grew up with was a horror show. Um, he created you to punish you and frightened you. And, uh, you know, as a girl and as a woman, you're just a piece of trash. And mm. so I said to her, I explained to her why I didn't believe in God and more than that, why I actually hated God. And then she asked me to design my own God. And she said, if you had the power to, you know, attribute a higher power, if, if you had the power to, to make your own God, what would you do? And <laughs> as I was going on, I thought, yeah, right. Uh, that's actually a description of Jesus Christ and Christianity at its best. And so instead of inventing yet another new God. <laughs> um, I started diving into, um, in, into that story. Um, and so far, um, you know, my husband and I go, went about, both of us saying we're atheists. And now it's, I, I like this story. I exploit it and um, the more I look at it, the more I don't want to say I'm fulfilled, but I feel I no longer have this need, this, this void, I have to say, and I mm. feel like I, I'm, I'm going somewhere. Mm. There are standards that I have to live by that are quite high, and that's daunting. 
Um, mm. But there, it, these are standards that I'd rather aspire to, aspire to and fail. Maybe the only human being who nearly achieved that was the late Queen Elizabeth. Um, <laughs> but trying to emulate her is this daily practice of hardship. <laughs> well, she never did interviews, so um, <laughs> that <was> a, <laughs> makes it easier. Yeah. <laughs> But that's, uh, you know, service and duty and selflessness and um, check your urges and your impulses and your anger and your resentment and your pride. I find these things much more appealing hmm. um, than go and convert the others and if they refuse. How should those of us who are not religious um, interpret your message? Is it those people, and in a way you do extrapolate your own journey to a cultural level because there is something akin to an existential crisis going on culture-wide. I think that a lot of people would, would see that. What, are there other routes, do you think, to, yeah. to filling that hole or, or, or healing a culture that don't involve religious conversion? I think what I would say is I'd ask for sort of respect for my, you know, very subjective, um, uh, like I said, there's this need that I have for spirituality. And I think that I'm getting somewhere with having that need met. Uh, but if you're not, if you don't have that, I think uh, we can live in mutual respect and friendship. In fact, I was communicating with one of my atheist friends who is baffled and who said, well, what are you doing, Ayan? <laughs> um, and and, and we are, it's this, I, I don't want uh, our friendship to be, uh, I respect him and he respects me. But on, on a bigger level, I think if you ask me what's going on in our society, um, my interpretation is people are asking for meaning um, and things don't make sense. New ageism do doesn't make sense. There's an article in The Atlantic this month um, where you know, there's a great deal of mental health crisis among teenagers. And they've looked into this and therapy hasn't helped. It doesn't help. It's not helping. Um, Again, I go back to the, what, what do immigrants have in common with Gen Z? And it's, you know, what is it that we want to transmit? And what I want to transmit to my children, that's what's summed up in Tom Holland's book, Dominion. And I think that's where it makes it, um, people will feel empowered when they know that there's something that they want to give to the next generation and something that they want to fight for. Mm. Um, so it's respect and love for the culture, even yeah. if you don't go all the way to the faith. Yeah, I would never force any of this on anyone. There's no coercion. Um, and, but there is a sense, I think, that there's something we've achieved and we just don't want to throw that out. And I think the conversations we've been having um, the, the critique of religious fundamentalism and, ex and extremism is welcome, but we shouldn't throw the baby with the bathwater. And I think we should also own what we've achieved. These Judeo-Christian debates that have gone on for centuries, they have led to good things. Now, we, we should own that. We've, we've, there's a great deal we've achieved mm. in terms of, you know, how... Um, the quality of life that humans uh, have achieved in the West, which is the envy of everyone else. Um, that we should acknowledge, we should own, we should preserve. I just wonder how you see this sort of role of Christianity fitting in a country where now less than 50% of the population identifies Christian, you have a very large number of non-religious and a very wide range of minority religions. So how would you see this sort of, you said about Christianity being so important, how that fits into civic matters if it's not coerced? I think if you define Christianity in its narrowest sense, people who accept um, 
Jesus Christ, who attend church, etc. You're right about those numbers, but I think if you accept, if you define it in a much broader term, on a civilizational level, I think you're going to see that most people, even though they say they're not Christian, uh, do. Um, it, it, it's a Christian society still. Um, it's one of the audience members came to me and talked to me about a book I wrote called Dawa. Um, and Dawa is the propagation, this infrastructure of trying to win hearts and minds uh, towards, and it's done without any violence, towards the teachings of Muhammad. And I think that the only way to fight Dawa is counter Dawa. And it's, you've got to put in the same level, if not more, effort into winning hearts and minds. And that story, that's the broader story of Christianity. Uh, and it can be done if we want to, it's a matter of will. I'm also somebody um, making a bit of a transition from atheism to my Jewish faith. So lovely to hear what you're talking about this evening. And I sense in our society that there's a lack of definition of what it is we stand for. Um, you know, what our ideals are. And so, you know, there's a lot of external, what external people believe in, but not what we believe in. And I think I look at the attempts that we've made in the past to make that like the Millennium Dome and the NHS parades at the Olympics and they all seem so paltry and trivial. And how how is it that we can convince our Gen Zs and our kids who are brought up in that kind of Islamist tradition that we've got something good to offer, particularly for people who don't come from faith? You know, what what is it that we offer that can bring a cohesive vision of British society um, that can cohere people around? What what can we do without faith? I think it's not what we it's answer. not an, it's not an easy question to answer, but it's I think what we've been talking about all evening, um, which is to get the broader question right. I think that if I ask the room, raise your hand if you believe in life, if you believe in liberty, if you believe in the rule of law, if you believe in due process, if you believe that power is checked and that power has to be um, spread, if you believe in independent and impartial courts, you're going to raise your hand to all of that. Now, try and now bring it to its roots and, and pass that story on. And what I've observed in the last few years, two, three decades, and I didn't see the significance of it until the emergence of the woke um, movement, is when we were told, you know, move, remove names like Easter and Christmas from schools or remove any kind of religious studies from schools and expand everything with this and dilute everything. I didn't understand the significance of what was happening, but now that that's quite clear and it is about dismantling our society brick by brick by removing every... Um, again, meaningful edifice of it, um, that's, I think, when you, you stand up to them by telling the story of how and why all this came about, and again, transmitting it. You don't have to run around with a Bible <laughs> and, uh, you know, hold these... Um, I've seen some of this in America where, you know, people pretend that uh, they're acting like Jesus and they talk in tongues and they say they're healing the ill and so on. You don't have to make a caricature of Christianity and the Judeo-Christian legacy, but I think it's very, very important that we understand the story on which this is built because human beings want stories. They like narratives and right now the prevailing narratives are destructive narratives. Wouldn't it be useful to have, well, Islam and Christianity in general, religious studies be more part of general education so that students can actually see what the difference is instead of just saying, here's the one thing, this is what we stand for, but also here is why we don't stand for that, or, or just sort of make up your own mind in terms of 
Do you, do you know what I mean? I, like, I, I know like, what mm. you mean, and it's called multiculturalism, and it has failed. <laughs> but, but, but they don't teach it in school, though. <laughs> it's, it's exactly the core of multiculturalism, is that all of these cultures are the same, they're equal. Why don't we just have a menu of these let, different... Let, let uh, yeah, oh, you have just a menu of these things, and why don't they just choose? Mm. And I think that it's unfair to young people to be told they're all equally the same. They are not. And I, we can sit here and I can argue why they're actually not, and Western Christian civilization is superior. And so I think at some point, we, we have to be able to say that. And if we don't do it, then these other narratives will come and fill in the void and take it one step further, as the woke are doing now, by saying, actually, Western civilization is based on exploitation and slavery and colonization. Let's decolonize. Now, if you go to American universities, and I'm sure this whole decolonization nonsense is here, what they're really teaching is that let's, because this is all, Western civilization is only based on these, you know, colonized, exploited, robbed, and raped peoples, Let's reverse the roles. Let's destroy everything, do that to white male heterosexuals, and start with a clean slate. Yeah. And that we need violence to do that. That's what's taught. I wonder whether you feel that atheism has, is an empty vessel and there's no hope for us, whether we've failed with the ideas and concepts that we have, which are very similar to Judeo-Christian um, values and things like that. We go into schools and try to talk to children and say, you don't need religion, you can have a good moral life, you know, bringing on the Gen Zs and all the rest of it. Do you think we've failed in terms of content or have we failed in terms of process because we've failed to establish church and all of the sorts of things that go with church and a modern day religion? Yeah. Um, I think it is partly content, partly process, but also partly history. Um, if you can take it all back to, you know, those fast stories and how that whole struggle and how it all came about, I think that you would answer, you would enhance your content with um, a story that then makes sense. Okay, back in the day we used to burn witches. We don't do that anymore. Why is that? Take the kids to have those conversations that people were having, and these were religious conversations, and they were having it within religious settings. So I think if you say we're going to have humanism or atheism um, and we're going to tear you know, the branches from the roots, that is when we get into trouble. The other thing about atheism is it's a negative concept. It is it's basically a declaration saying, I don't believe that there is evidence that an entity called God exists. Other than that, it's nothing else. It's an assumption that if people conclude that, we're going to have all individuals you know, united around reason and enlightenment and knowledge and tolerance and moderation, but that's not how it turned out to be. <laughs> Do you believe that we were created by the Abrahamic God? And if you do, um, have you always believed that's the case? And you've simply um, changed the flavor of that belief over time. Mm -hmm. If you don't, is this more a sense of political pragmatism from you at the moment? I think that's a very good question. I think, uh, Freddie, you asked that earlier. Um, I think that I have not, again, my atheist friends want to see evidence because you say, do you believe that God created? And then you say, well, have you got any evidence for God? So I want to sidestep that question by saying, I do believe it, that there are stories and I choose to believe the story that uh, there is a higher power. Um, again, it, what that means, I'm still developing, I'm still learning as much as I can, but I choose to believe in that story because the legacy of that story is what we are living through. So it, yes, it's partly pragmatic, and yes, it is partly personal and spiritual. And it's a story I like because it's a story that says human life is worth living 
because it's in the image of God. And instead of seeking God somewhere out there who's ordering you to do all sorts of things, God is something in you. That's much, much more appealing to me than um, the story of there's nothing there. You have no more value than mold. <laughs> and that's atheism. And I think if you tell people they have no more value than mold, then you will, what's the point? <laughs> Ladies yeah, and gentlemen. I had no idea how uh, open Ayan was, was prepared to be this evening. I think it's extraordinary that she has spoken so candidly with us uh, and, as always, so eloquently and powerfully. And I think we'd just like to say thank you so much for coming to Unheard. Thank you, Teddy.